I had asked you a minute ago when you were in your smaller conversation groups, what is your favorite or least favorite saying or cliche? Does anybody want to offer up what your answer was? Everything happens for a reason. Bingo. That is the winning answer. Everything happens for a reason. Did you know what I was preaching on today? So I want to talk about this uh, passage John read for us out of Romans chapter 8. This idea that everything happens for a reason is how it has migrated in our culture because we took God out of the saying. So in Romans 8, it says all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to God's purpose, right? Well, as we have moved into a secular age, right, in the last couple hundred years, sayings that come out of scripture have migrated into our culture, but like de godded And so we ended up with just these sort of Benjamin Franklin-esque cliches, right? And so people are very fond of saying everything happens for a reason. Now, I hate this saying more than I can possibly articulate to you, but here's the thing. If people mean that things happen as a consequence of decisions that we make and the system that we're caught up in, then yes, I would say, yes, everything does happen for a reason. And we should find out why that happened. But they don't mean it that descriptively. They almost mean it prescriptively in that, well, I know it doesn't make sense now, but there's an end point or a goal in this, and the thing is working for your good to bring about this greater end, right? And to that I say, nine! <laughs> Which is German for no. <laughs> no, no, we're not going down that road. I mean, I could make light of this this morning, but I'll tell you where this really became consequential for me. When I was a pastor in upstate New York, uh, my wife uh, worked in rape crisis and domestic violence counseling. And to hear her stories as she came home and how this passage and the ideas that we have inherited from it, the role that they play in domestic violence and sexual assault are mortifying. And as a pastor, to hear that confession and think, what have we done? So today, I want to continue what we've been doing this summer, which is to challenge assumptions. So I want to challenge assumption, A, that everything works for the good, which is how Romans 8 gets translated, and how it gets migrated into our culture without God is everything happens for a reason. I want to challenge that assumption today, but I want to start in a different uh, place. So to put up the next slide, I want to start with Batman. And I want to talk about the good. So here's the thing. Batman is a terrible human being. Now, I know that some of you are like, oh, I think he's a hero. In fact, he's a superhero. But as my friend Peter Rollins points out in the book Church in the Present Tense, if Batman, Bruce Wayne, from Wayne Enterprises, multi-millionaire, billionaire maybe, if he took even a quarter of the profits from Wayne Enterprises, that he puts towards things like body armor and the Batmobile and the underground lair, if he took even a quarter of that money and invested it in things like childhood education or job training for those who have been released from internment or imprisonment, he could almost single-handedly eliminate the very things he stays up all night fighting as a vigilante. Batman is not working for the good. Whatever the common good is, Batman is not working for that. Batman is working for his own ego and a sense of vengeance that his parents got murdered. Is everybody with me here? <laughs> Batman is not working for the good. It would be the equivalent, you know Tom's shoes? If you buy one pair of shoes, they give a second pair of shoes to somebody in need, right? So people feel really good about spending, let's be honest, a little extra money to buy a pair of shoes because they know that the, some of the profit from that expensive pair of shoes is going to profit somebody who is in need by giving them a pair of shoes. But imagine that Tom's shoes used 
factories in China or Africa that, that employed slave labor, then Tom Shoes, ironically, would not be working for the good. And it seems obvious when you see a model like Tom's Shoes, you think, well, I know I'm paying a little bit extra for this, but it's going to a good cause. And this is the danger of capitalism. That you and I are actually caught up in a monstrous and demonic web of consuming where we justify part of our consumption by saying, well, part of the profits go to a good cause. And in that sense, you and I are not working for the good all the time. We are monsters who are caught up in a monstrous web, a machine that exploits those on the margins and who are disadvantaged. We are villains in the Batman story. And it's mortifying to realize when you wake up, and some of you aren't woke up, but when you wake up to the fact that we are caught up in this monstrous web of exploitation and consumption, and we think, yeah, but I mean, what am I supposed to do? I've got to buy a pair of shoes. If I bought this pair of shoes, at least somebody else would get a pair of shoes. So for that, I'll pay a little bit extra. Or at Starbucks. I'll buy, instead of a $3 bottle of water, I'll buy the $4 ethos water because with that fourth dollar, they're going to dig a well in Africa. Right? And this is how we justify being part of a disastrously corrupt system. We do it with Wells Fargo banking accounts and so many other things. I just bought a new house. I was never more aware of the racism built into the system than when I was trying to find a new house. Between the legacy of banks redlining who could buy in what neighborhoods and then community covenants, I was very aware that anywhere I felt safe or I was comfortable living had been provided for me by a racist system of the last 60 years and that I don't have to be racist because the system of banking and real estate is racist on my behalf. <laughs> and therefore, I get to be one of the good white people who's just looking for a place that I'm comfortable living, right, that has good possible resale value, and I don't have to be explicitly racist because I'm part of such a racist system, it's racist on my behalf. That is not the good. So when we come to verses like Romans chapter, when we come to Romans chapter 8, and it says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to God's purpose, and then you look at the real estate market and the legacy of banking redlining and so many other things about education and capitalism and consumerism, it becomes impossible in the 21st century to say that all things work together for the good of those who love God. You cannot say it. This passage becomes an impossible passage to quote unless you understand it in a better way. And that's when our theme throughout July is better Bible reading. If you've missed the series up to this point, they're all online. You can watch them on YouTube or on our website. We've been taking passages of the Bible that are well known, and we've been saying there's a bad reading of this. What's a better reading of this? So I'm going to ask the question. In this Romans chapter 8 passage, who's working? And here's where we come into a really bizarre thing that when... Other languages, like for instance, the Bible was written in Greek. This New Testament was written in Greek. Gets translated into English. Now, how many of you are here are at least bilingual? You know at least one other language? Yeah, some of you? You know, some languages have genders in them, genders built in. Some languages, uh, like for instance, German, the verbs, right, come at the end. You can construct sentences differently. So when you import or translate one, like Greek, into another, sometimes it comes in quite in a clumsy way. And Romans chapter 8 is one of those passages. Because in English it says, all things work together for the good. But I want to propose to you today that it's not the things that are working for your good. We've, we've placed the emphasis on the wrong part. A better translation of this would be, for in all things, God 
is working for your good. So I want you to think about this, this better reading. The agent who is at work in the things is God. And that doesn't mean that the things themselves are working for you. Can we just say some things are working against you? <laughs> right? Some things are working against you. Whether it's your age or your health or your family of origin, or your computer, your technology. Thank you. Yes, your technology. Some things are working against you. So it's just not true to say that all things are working for your good. It's not a true statement. But as people of faith, I want you to consider this. Is it possible that in both the good things and the bad things, that in all things, God is working for you because of love. We've translated this passage poorly, and it has had disastrous consequences. And when we lord it over people, it almost becomes like a battering ram, like a, a hammer, right? Where we Bible thump people into saying, all things, right? Everything happens for a reason. All things work together for the good of those who love God. Do you love God? It doesn't feel like you love God because you're doubting this thing. But the thing itself is not working for you. But there is a force at work in all things for you. So God, in all things, good and bad, is working because of love. It's a totally different sort of way of seeing the world, looking at your own story, looking at the bigger picture, both in the good and in the bad, God is at work. And if we have ears to hear, eyes to see, if we have tuned ourselves to the great key, as the Great Lake Swimmer says, if we have tuned ourselves to the great key, we hear how this thing could go in the direction of good. But first, we have to say, what is the good? In the 21st century global capitalism, what's the good? To lift up the marginalized and the disadvantaged? To care for those who have been beat up and put out by the system? Is that the good? Because if that's the good, then we can't say that all things are working for the good. But if we say that there is a common good and we want to work towards that, then we have to figure out how to find God in the midst of all things. And one of the very simple ways that we do that is by challenging this whole sacred secular split that Sunday is a sacred day and the rest of the days are ordinary, right? It's that division of our life that makes us fractured people, not whole, not with integrity, integer, but we have fractured up our lives and we say, well, this part belongs to God and this part is everything else. And that division has to come down because God is at work in all things for the good because of love. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Sarah, will you come pray for us?